the multimedia-driven 1990s had seen a paradigm shift in the design of CPUs. An emphasis on floating point performance meant that by the turn of the millennium, processors were equipped to handle high resolution displays, complex creative applications, and rich 3D graphics. But with a clock speed wall soon approaching, the next 20 years would be defined by packaging multiple CPU cores onto a single die. While the previous 25 years was based around ever-growing clock speeds, these new designs would require a whole new way of thinking. This was the era of the multi-core mindset. The year is 2002. And with Intel's mainstream and workstation performance behind its rival, AMD, the company attempted to boost performance with a new technology called hyperthreading. Hyperthreading was an implementation of SMT, or simultaneous multithreading, a technique that created an additional virtual processor, which allowed applications to take advantage of underused parts of the processing pipeline. This was first seen in new Intel Xeon workstation processors, which replaced the Pentium 3 Xeons which occupied the space. The technology was used to close the performance gap to the AMD Athlon MP, a dual socket version of the Athlon XP. The feature was brought to the desktop with the high-end Pentium 4 CPUs in May 2003. This, combined with a super-fast 800MHz frontside bus, meant that the Pentium pulled ahead of the Athlon XP. AMD responded by releasing the Athlon 64, the first 64-bit x86 CPU. The processor was based on AMD's Opteron server CPU, which had been released earlier in the year. At first, the achievement didn't seem that impressive. There were other 64-bit CPUs around. Many RISC architectures had reached the 64-bit milestone far earlier. It wasn't even the first 64-bit desktop CPU. The Power Mac G5, powered by the PowerPC 970, had been released three months prior. But none of this mattered because AMD's architecture could do what no other architecture could, run both 64 and 32-bit x86 applications at full speed. There was another architecture that could run both, Intel's Itanium, which was a RISC-based 64-bit CPU that featured a 32-bit x86 compatibility layer. The Itanium, however, suffered huge performance penalties on running 32-bit x86 code. The Athlon's architecture didn't. Intel tried to combat AMD's press coverage by announcing a fully unlocked version of the Pentium 4, the Pentium 4 Extreme Edition. This quickly gained the nickname Emergency Edition due to its sudden announcement being conveniently a week before the Athlon 64's release. The initial launch of the Athlon was somewhat mixed. The chip was the fastest out there, no question. But it was expensive, and the requirement to use buffered memory on high-end Athlon 64 FX products added further costs. There were also production issues. At launch, AMD could only produce 100,000 chips a month. These problems eventually ironed out, and the Athlon 64 sold well. While the Pentium 4 was fast for content creation workloads, in gaming, the Athlon 64 and 64FX were far ahead. <laughs> 
Revisions of the Pentium 4 and Athlon 64 chips were rolled out throughout 2004 and early 2005. But while the Pentium 4 remained competitive, the product was suffering from high power draw and temperatures as Intel cranked the clock speeds higher and higher. The true step forward was met in 2005 with the release of the dual-core Pentium D and Athlon 64X2. The Pentium D was essentially two Pentium 4 processors on the same package, whereas the Athlon was a monolithic design, again coming from AMD's work in the server space. The Athlons, just like their single-core counterparts, were faster out the box, but AMD charged a heavy price premium, and with a good overclock, the Pentium could trade blows for far less money. It was clear by now, however, that the Pentium 4 was not a smart design. In an effort to try and continuously improve clock speeds, questionable design decisions were made that would harm the architecture in the long run. The P4's notoriously long 31-stage instruction pipeline made the processor inefficient, and when it was clear that going beyond 4 GHz would be impossible, Intel knew that they had to change the architecture. But things were already looking up for the company. Apple had transitioned away from PowerPC processors to Intel's, making AMD Intel's only competitor in the desktop CPU space. In addition, AMD had become complacent with their performance, using revenue to buy graphics company ATI rather than invest in R&D. Intel decided to base their new architecture on the Pentium M, a mobile chip originally based on the Pentium 3 design. The Pentium M was designed to be as power efficient as possible, and while being based on the Pentium 3, it took many of the improvements from the Pentium 4 and incorporated them into the core. To show that the company was moving away from the Pentium 4 approach, they created a brand new name for their processors. Intel Core. The first Intel Core product was the Intel Core Solo and Intel Core Duo in early 2006. These chips were laptop exclusives and were nothing more than Pentium M processors with minor tweaks. However, ported to a new manufacturing process, they provided class leading performance and were successful. Their biggest weakness was that they were still only 32 bit chips, but Intel knew that this would be fixed in the next design. And boy, was it a big one. The Core 2 Duo family, released in July 2006, was nothing short of a game changer. The chips, based on Intel's new Conroe architecture, were up to twice as fast as the Pentium Ds they replaced, and crushed the performance of competing Athlon 64 CPUs. The mid-range E6600 was a particular gem. It cost around $320, but was faster than the $900 Athlon FX52, which was AMD's flagship. The chips received glowing reviews in the technology press, citing the high performance, low power consumption, and great value. The architecture had been given a wealth of upgrades, which each gave small single-digit performance increases. The chip itself was given a huge 4 megabytes of L3 cache, could fuse instructions together to decode more instructions per cycle, and had beefy out-of-order instruction capabilities. When combined together, along with a whole host of other improvements, the chip was a quantum leap in performance. And crucially, AMD had nothing to match it 
The company refreshed its lineup with slightly faster Athlons with much lower prices, but they just weren't fast enough. Furthermore, the launch of Core 2 Quad, a dual die version of the Core 2 Duo, pushed Intel's technology lead even further ahead. In an age where dual cores were only just being utilised, most people had no need for a quad core processor. And at a launch price of $850 for the cheapest version, the chip was a niche product. But this didn't matter, because the Halo chip was a demonstration that Intel was king. The Core 2 Quads rapidly dropped in price throughout 2007. Three months after release, the Q6600, the most popular Core 2 Quad part, had its price reduced by $300. By July, the price had dropped to just $266. AMD finally responded to Intel's lineup in late 2007 with the launch of Phenom. But the chips were overpriced and a hit with an architectural bug which dropped performance further. The main problem with Phenom was it simply couldn't clock fast enough. The chips struggled to get past 2.5 GHz. The product was relaunched six months later, with the architectural bug fixed, increased clock speeds, and a lower price. The Phenom was now competitive, but only just. Towards the end of 2008 and early 2009, Successors from both companies were released. The Core i7 from Intel was launched in late 2008 and offered noticeable performance gains over the Core 2 Quad. But the product was hampered by the requirement for expensive DDR3 memory and a reduction in L2 cache size meant that some software saw no performance gain. AMD released its new architecture, the Phenom 2, in January 2009, to warm reception. The chip wasn't as fast as the Core i7, but it was competitive with the Core 2 quads, and could be dropped into the now 3-year-old AM2 motherboards for a cost-effective upgrade. Six core CPUs came in early 2010 with the Core i7-980X being released by Intel and the Phenom 2X6 being released by AMD. The i7 was a chip that could do it all. It had impressive multi-threaded performance when applications could use all six cores and blistering single core speed when they couldn't. The Phenom wasn't so impressive, but thanks to its low price, it was at least competitive. Going into 2011, both AMD and Intel had brand new microarchitectures on the horizon, with Intel detailing its new Sandy Bridge microarchitecture in late 2010. From the surface, Sandy Bridge was an evolution of the Nehalem architecture of the previous Core i7. But under the hood, there were a variety of improvements, which gave it a boost of around 30% over the original Core i7. This was impressive on its own, but the biggest advantage with Sandy Bridge was the affordability. The Core i7-2600K could match the previous flagship, the 6-core i7-980X, but was $700 cheaper at only $317. But the real star was the Core i5-2500K, delivering 90% of the performance of the 2600K at roughly half the price. The chips were given glowing reviews in the tech press. Anantech called them a no-brainer 
and AMD would have to deliver something special to keep up. Early in development, AMD had reported that its upcoming bulldozer architecture was up to 50% faster than the original Core i7, and many hoped for a return to top tier performance. Bulldozer was a radical departure from previous designs. In prior architectures, each core got its own caches, units, and interconnects, and were largely independent with one another. In Bulldozer, AMD grouped two cores together into a module, which shared some resources, such as the level 2 cache and floating point unit. This compromise was done to try and boost clock speeds of the part, something which had always troubled AMD with the original Phenom. If clock speeds were high enough, then the chip would easily outperform its predecessor. There was just one problem. They weren't. The flagship FX8150 was barely faster than the Phenom 2X6, despite having 8 cores compared to the Phenom 6. In single threaded workloads, the FX chips were slower than Phenom, and compared to Sandy Bridge, they were hopeless. Because of the lackluster performance, AMD could only price their chips up to a certain point, which meant that revenue started to decrease. At first, it wasn't a problem. With strong GPU sales and sales of Phenom, enabling the company to bring home a net income of $491 million in 2011. But a year later, the company made a net loss of $1.18 billion. AMD were forced to sell its foundries, lay off staff, drastically cut down on R&D, and even sell its headquarters. The company tried to fix the broken architecture, first by cranking up the clock speed, and then gradually modifying the core design. But this did little to help, because Intel's architecture was so far ahead. Faced with no competition, Intel spent almost all of its focus on the mobile market, beefing up the integrated graphics and improving power consumption. This was mainly achieved using the company's unmatched lead in the silicon manufacturing. Even if AMD could make a chip as powerful, it would be slower due to Intel's foundry advantage. Intel were dominant for the next five years, and faced with no competition, rolled out endless quad cores with slightly higher performance. Sandy Bridge was followed by Ivy Bridge, essentially a die shrink to the 22 nanometer platform. This was followed by Haswell, Broadwell, and then Skylake, each being minor improvements. Many people started to feel like these new chips were lazy upgrades, but with AMD so far behind, people had no choice but to buy them. Faced with bankruptcy, AMD took drastic action. First, most resources were put behind developing a brand new CPU architecture called Zen. This left AMD's graphics line vulnerable, but AMD had never really broke through with graphics, and so this was deemed a necessary sacrifice. They beefed up efforts with Microsoft and Sony to produce the hardware for the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 consoles, helping to diversify revenue streams. The company also gained a new CEO in late 2014, Lisa Su who had joined the company in 2012 from HP Enterprise. With restructuring in place, and the company now stable, AMD went into 2017 with great hope. Their new CPU architecture was ready. 
The Zen core was far more traditional than the Bulldozer concept, reverting back to an independent core design over Bulldozer's modules. It brought new features such as a micro-op cache, simultaneous multi-threading, and a dramatically improved floating point engine. The architecture was also built on the new 14 nanometer FinFET process, which yielded further efficiency gains. The biggest advantage Zen had, however, was its high core count, featuring up to 8 cores on a single Zen die. Launched in early 2017, Ryzen, which was the brand name of the Zen product family, was met with praise from the tech press. The top end chips were equal in performance to the Intel Core i7-6900K, but the Ryzen's were a third the price. While single threaded performance of clocks were still behind Intel's latest architecture, KB Lake, you got twice the cores for the same price. Consumers, who had been stuck with a maximum of 4 cores for the last 11 years, were suddenly shown just how dangerous a monopoly could be. Intel quickly responded, releasing a 6 core Main Street processor, the i7-8700K, 6 months later. The Ryzen family was refreshed in April 2018 with minor tweaks and higher clock speeds being released as the Ryzen 2000 series. And in October, Intel further increased core count with the Core i9-9900K, which brought 8 cores to Intel's mainstream platform. Intel had hoped to transition products across to their new 10 nanometer node in 2015, but it had been plagued with problems, and even 5 years later, it still wasn't ready for the desktop. The company mitigated this by making continuous improvements to its 14 nanometer process, but AMD, who used TSMC and Samsung foundries, could leap ahead and gain a node advantage. While TSMC 7 nanometer was only slightly better than Intel 10 nanometer process, it had great yields and could be used for a desktop sized die. In July 2019, AMD fully utilised the new node with their Ryzen 3000 family, based on the Zen 2 architecture. The core design was the same as the original Ryzen, but with an improved memory controller and double the L3 cache, significantly improving gaming performance. The Zen 2 architecture also innovated by using a chiplet design which separated the I.O. and compute portions of the chip into two distinct dies. This was done because the compute portion gained large benefit when moving to the new expensive process, whereas moving the I.O. die saw little benefit. Thus, by separating the dies, the I.O. could be manufactured using older and cheaper lithographies without impacting performance. This chiplet design allowed AMD to double the core count, bringing 16 cores to the mainstream desktop. Stuck on its 14 nanometer process, Intel could only increase core count by 25%, releasing its 10 core i9 10900K in May 2020. So, what's next? Since 2005, we've hit a wall with clock speeds, being limited by power draw and heat dissipation. Furthermore, as the process nodes shrink, the cost to develop new chips is growing at an exponential rate. In 2001, when the Pentium 4 was first introduced, there were 23 foundries who are manufacturing the bleeding edge 130 nanometer process. With the latest 7 nanometer node, only 3 are left Intel, Samsung, and TSMC. With these limitations, 
the future of x86 looks underwhelming. More cores, bigger caches, minor architectural improvements, but 50% increases in performance, you can forget it. To keep pushing boundaries, it will require truly groundbreaking innovation. But that's exactly how we got here in the first place.